Good morning. And welcome to worship. Glad that we could be together as the people of God. Just wanted to share uh, a couple portions from a few psalms this morning uh, as they relate to our message today and the power of God's word. Some Psalm 50. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. The fire devours before him, and around him the tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth below. Listen to my prayer, O my Lord. Come, do not ignore our plea. Answer us and come to us for our thoughts, even though they trouble us and we may be distraught, we know that you will be with us. And so with that, the blessing of our Lord, we go forth in our worship today. would encourage you to read the prayer in preparation for worship this morning as we listen to the uh, prelude in preparation for worship.
If you're able, please stand. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord our God. For a day is your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to his glorious name. We, we shall, shall proclaim your love and faithfulness in the morning. If we claim to have fellowship with our God, yet walk in darkness, slipping into old habits that do not honor our Lord, we are not living by the truth. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Let us confess our sins to our God so we might be restored and forgiven. Sometimes our words and actions show how we are sought for the world, but then come those moments when we lose our flavor and our way. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It is God's desire that we be holy as he is holy. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but for the whole sin of the whole world. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. What good is it if we say we love all people, but give special treatment to a few? God, God calls us to love others as deeply as we love ourselves, with, with no strings attached. What good is it if we say we want God to show mercy toward us, but are quick to judge others? It is the Lord's desire that we act like the good Samaritan and show mercy. God calls us to forgive our sisters and brothers, to let mercy triumph over judgment. You ask us to speak out against injustice, and we whisper because we are afraid someone might hear us. You ask us to see the pain and poverty around us, but we close our eyes. You tell us that everyone and each one is created in your image, yet we persist in noticing the differences between us and others. We stand before you, saving God, stripped of our pretensions and pride, for nothing we do or say or do not can be hidden from you. It is true, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It judges the attitude and thoughts of the heart, exposing us for what we are. Great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we, we should be called the children of God. God it's God's, great is God's mercy to all who call upon him. There is a righteousness that comes from the God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice of atonement for sin, and do all who believe are justified freely by his grace. You are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. The first lesson for today is from Ezekiel chapter 17. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender spring from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. 
I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading for today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed, instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we may make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, brother whether good or bad. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. As you are able, please rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. We continue in the gospel of Mark. This is Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 26. Jesus also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, and then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all the garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated for the message hymn.
grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us share the text that's printed for us this morning. It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Well, in the message today, I hope to answer three questions. What is the kingdom of God? How does the kingdom grow? And three, what is our responsibility as we participate in the kingdom of God? I see that a lot of individuals this morning have brought some surplus from their garden in the back. Well, we have a garden too at our house. And I know that many of you have a garden at home as well. Some of you may even start your plants in a hothouse. But most of us probably buy our garden plants and vegetables in small pots already ready to be planted. Have you noticed how tiny a tomato seed is? They are really small. And it takes a long time to sprout. I personally have been trying to plant zinnia, flower plants, you know, the little seeds. Those seeds are small too. They are very small. And yet when they sprout, the flowers are beautiful. I'm on my third planting. <laughs> Something went wrong, right? When Jesus began his ministry, he announced the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So what is the kingdom of God? Every time I read that phrase in the Bible, I have to stop and think about that phrase. Because my immediate thought is a geographical territory. Pastor James Voltz of Concordia Seminary says that the kingdom of God is really the rule of God, which is not geographical. John Ruman, in his book, Jesus in the Church's Gospels, writes, the words of Jesus, the kingdom of God, does not mean a geographical kingdom like Great Britain. It is not a territorial or political organization set up for the purpose of government. It has no capital city, no parliament building, no royal trappings. The kingdom of God is God's rule on earth through Jesus and through the ongoing ministry of the church as you and I partner with God through the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. For generations, the Christian church has sung the liturgical Te Deum. Remember the phrase? Jesus has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. And then each Sunday, we ask, may your kingdom come every time we speak the Lord's Prayer. And when we do, we are asking and praying that His power will bring peace and defeat evil in our culture. That's what the prayer is about. Jesus told memorable stories about extravagant wedding banquets and lost sheep and tiny seeds that earn a thousand percent return on their investment. He did not write a book, but his stories have been speaking to people for generations. The stories are normally called parables, and a parable is a story that states something true about life or about God. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed. When it is sown in the ground, it is the smallest of seeds in the ground. And yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants. And its seeds will send out great branches so that the birds of the air can find shelter in the shade. When a teacher tells a story, it's common for the student to ask, what's the point? Because that's what teachers do. They offer questions to make us think. They tell stories to make a point, an illustration of some topic or a theme or a lesson. But with the New Testament parables, it is Jesus himself. He is the point. He is the lamp on the stand that gives light to the house. He is the farmer who is out in the field. He is the word, the seed that is sown into the ground to die so that he can rise and send out his branches so that you and I might find shelter in his shade. This parable of the mustard seed is the first 
in a list of seven stories that Jesus is going to tell through the Gospel of Mark. Last week, in Mark chapter 3, we found out that Jewish leaders had accused Jesus of working miracles by the power of the devil. The die was now cast. And the religious leaders had made their own choice. And they're now going to do whatever it takes to cancel Jesus. And we know what cancel culture does to people. It wipes them out. And that's what they were going to do with Jesus. Cancel him. Because Jesus is an unknown rabbi. He didn't go to college down in Jerusalem where all the others went. He's an unknown rabbi in a small piece of land far from the center of Roman power. He has 12 followers. Some are fishermen. Others are women who have been healed of various diseases. When he's dying on the cross, people laughed and made sport. On that day, one might have asked the serious question, Will the message of Jesus about God's salvation and God's offer of forgiveness and eternal life, will it ever take root? Will his words die with his death on the cross? In response, Jesus tells this parable of the mustard seed. He said the seed is the word of God in the ministry of Jesus. It is very small, and it may seem very small to you. It may seem insignificant but it is God who will give the growth. There was a story in Acts chapter 5 that verifies the same point. And Peter and John had just been arrested and they're brought before the Sanhedrin. And there's going to be a response by Gamaliel. Now Gamaliel was the top Jewish professor in Jerusalem. And he was, uh, uh, had Paul as one of his students. And so this is what happens. Peter and the other apostles replied when they were questioned. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious. And they wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. And then he addressed them. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you tend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all of his followers were dispersed. And all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. Well, he too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But it, it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. It may seem insignificant, even with 12 followers and a few women. But the resurrection changed everything. You and I possess the promises of Jesus. We're like the farmer. And every farmer knows that not all the seeds you plant end up yielding crops or beautiful flowers. I'm on my third planting of zinnia seeds. Finally, some have sprouted. Our responsibility is to imitate Jesus. We're to be sight and light in a or so we're to be salt and light in a culture that wants to reject the Ten Commandments. But we are to keep the Ten Commandments so that people will see the difference. We're to tell the story of God's offer of eternal life. That's it. Tell the story of Jesus as we offer love and care and servanthood and sow seeds of the gospel. My little Xenia seed, I know some will take root, and finally they had. And they will produce beautiful flowers. God created the seed. He gives the growth. God's kingdom works like the mustard seed. It begins small. Some people will scorn the message. Others will be receptive. You know, just the last several months, Pastor 
do it took how many people took you did you take through that inquirer's class six seven. seven and it was a long time for them to come but the seed had been planted probably years or so before and you were able to participate in the fruit of that seed and and now it's the time process the seed sounds so small and the gospel seems so small but it will produce fruit and he was able to participate in that harvest with those individuals because other people will be receptive. God's kingdom will grow and give shade to the sick, the poor, the imprisoned, and the unloved. Remember a few weeks ago, I told you of a longtime friend who had shared with my wife Colleen at a mutual event that she was very upset at what the pastor had said to her very religious sister who was dying. And she said, ah, but I'm an atheist. Well, my wife and her chatted for a while and then uh, we decided we're going to send her a small gospel of John with some written notes in it. This past week, we got a thank you note from her. It is a mustard seed. Will it grow? Well, that's God's responsibility. We pray that it takes root. The kingdom of Jesus is not built on the basis of race or class or division. For some in our culture these days, it is easy to join the politics of polarization, to find oneself shouting across the picket lines at the enemy on the other side, or destroying the name of those with whom you disagree. The kingdom of God calls me to love the woman who just walked out of the abortion clinic. The kingdom of God calls me and you to restore life and hope to the women who are breaking out of prostitution through our local breaking the chains. The kingdom of God calls me to help restore the truth of family values in a culture that seeks to cancel the traditional family. And you've seen people all across the country rise up to hold to the truth of the family. All his life, Jesus had been involved in various forms of culture wars against a religious, rigid establishment and a pagan empire. And he simply responded by giving his life for those who opposed him. On the cross, he forgave them. And then three days later, he rose from death in the grave so that all who believe in him would escape the eternal wrath of a righteous creator and judge. Jesus said the seed is the word of God. It is the only thing that has the power to change the human heart. Preaching alone won't do it because we can't talk people into a new heart. Our words have no power in and of themselves without the Holy Spirit. The only thing that produces lasting growth is the word of God. Our job is simply share the story, sow the seed. Michael Heiser in his book The Unseen Realm writes, there is nothing that we do that God could not accomplish by himself. But he has not chosen that method. Rather, he tells us what his will is and commands us, his loyal children, to get the job done. And thus we are to sow the seeds of the gospel, tell the story of Jesus. It's in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Here's a fact. Wherever you go, Jesus goes. Wherever you go, Jesus goes. Vern and Marianne, you're going on vacation. You're not going alone. And there'll be people that run across your path, and they may have questions. Wherever you go, Jesus goes. His Holy Spirit dwells in you. Planting seeds is telling the story of Jesus in your life. People in your relationships, they know you're different. People in your relationships also know the world is selfish. And they want to know why you're not. They want to know why you're kind. They want to know why you're generous. And so when they ask spiritual questions, you know that they're seeking answers to life. When Jesus lived on the earth, he made the blind to see, the lame to walk. He will return to create a new heaven and a new earth and to rule over a kingdom that has no disease or disability. On earth, he cast out demons. At his resurrection and at his return, he will destroy the evil one forever. On earth, he came as a baby born in a manger and will return as the conquering Lord. 
On earth he died and was resurrected. At his return he'll raise all the believers who have died and give to us our resurrected glorified body that was never meant to die. The Christian church is the body of Jesus on earth and we are the zenia plants. We are the mustard seeds. We are the society that welcomes people of all races and social classes that is characterized by love, acceptance, and not division. It is the culture and it is the power brokers who create tribalism and hatred and we are the salt and the light that breaks that. We work for justice and righteousness in a culture that prefers selfishness and power. Let the world see your servanthood. One Jewish rabbi named Jesus who started with a few fishermen who died on the cross and rose from the grave. He was that small mustard seed. It grew as the Holy Spirit touched hearts. Amen. And so we pray that his rule grows in our life and in our world. Let us continue our order of worship by the singing of the next hymn for fruits of his creation. rise and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not money, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. 
As you well know, our offering plates are in the back on the table, and you could utilize that as you enter in or as you leave our services today. We uh, truly appreciate your giving throughout this last year and a few months that has kept uh, uh, the church moving and salaries paid and uh, the ministry alive and going. So thank you very, very much for uh, your service and your commitment to the ministry. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we know that uh, you, our Lord, was not always loved when you walked the earth. And we know the Pharisees tried to counsel you. And so, Lord, when that happens around us, remind us that we are to be the salt and light and still proclaim your word and let your Holy Spirit to do the work that he is called to do. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we rejoice with those who are recovering some, from surgery in our parish. We think of Jan and we think of Matthew. We ask that you would continue to guide the physicians with wisdom in their care. For those who will soon be going in for surgery, we ask for that same kind of wisdom and skill from the hand of the physician to bring healing to their body. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, for all who are serving in uh, the military services, and first responders, we ask that uh, as people travel and as they uh, serve in ministry to those who are traveling or who are in need because of a crisis, we ask that you would bless their hands and bless the lives of those that they touch. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we continue to pray for our nation and our president and all who are in positions of leadership, whether it be city, county, or state, or federal. We ask that you would remind them always that they are to be selfless in their service. If there is selfishness in their heart, we would ask that you would place it on display for the world to see. We pray that people will imitate you as we seek to imitate you as well. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And precious Heavenly Fathers, we prepare for the sacrament that you have provided for us, for the refreshment of our soul. We ask that you would bless all who come to your altar this day, knowing that forgiveness is true and real and secure, and we are set free to be your people when we leave this place. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of Almighty God into your hearts and into your homes. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Let us join together in our closing hymn. in our community center and look forward to worshiping in the sanctuary next week. 
We bless all of you for your time and your worship and your support. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.